This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being. Being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. When we resolve the illusion that we are separate from Source, the illusion of the physical world will resolve itself. Live long and prosper, Mr. Spock said. You are life everlasting and power far beyond your limiting beliefs. Know who you are as an aspect of Source and the creator of your reality. The end of duality is yours through understanding, intention, and practice. Be bound for ascension. Do not let anyone or anything block you from knowing the eternal bliss of oneness and all that you are, Marsha. Valeria interviews Marsha Hankins, the author of Awaken to Ascension, Mastering Oneness and Knowing Yourself as Source. Marsha Hankins has been a spiritual teacher and facilitator for more than 25 years. Her passion for teaching is evident as she shares her experiences of spiritual evolution with others. Marsha believes the goal of life is raising our frequency to remember the pure light of who we all are. She shares her knowledge and awareness of the ascension process with understanding and compassion for our spiritual growth. And she hopes her insights and techniques will help others find spiritual mastery. Marsha teaches and writes what she knows based on her personal experiences of healing and expansion and those of her students and clients. She believes we all need teachers, but the final steps are up to us. Her desire is to help others cross the fourth dimensional bridge of awareness into full fifth dimensional consciousness. Meet Marsha at MarshaHankins.com. Here's the interview with Marsha Hankins. In your own words, who is Marsha Hankins? Well, you know, when I was younger, everybody would answer those kind of questions with what they did, what their job was, what they did in the outer world. And I did the same thing. And then as I woke up to my spiritual nature, I started looking inward and thinking, you know, who am I? And we're all just children of source. We're children of the light or children of love. But in that same respect, what I do is also part of who I am. Because back when I was younger, being a dancer and an accountant, a teacher, these different things, they were what I did, but they weren't part of who I were, who I was. <laughs> but today, um, as a spiritual teacher and author and facilitator, um, those are the extensions of who I am. It's how I share my love with the world. So I just see myself as a spiritual being trying to do the best I can to expand my love and my light and my compassion and my understanding and to share that with other people in the best way that I can. It sounds very beautiful to me to know that you have awakened to that true nature, which you call spiritual nature, and became a spiritual teacher. And also the love piece, that's, it seems like it goes together, my emotion, spirituality and love. And with that in mind, I guess I'll ask you this fundamental question about how did you come to be or to understand these spiritual truths that you understand today? How did this happen? I just woke up very quickly. Um, most people, I think, just kind of wander a little bit at a time trying to find their spiritual path and discover who they are. And when I was younger, um, 
very young. I had a very interest. I had big interest in lots of spiritual things, but over the years, you know, as you're growing up, kind of things, you know, hit you in the face and the world gets in your way and you kind of push that aside for a while. And I did that. I pushed everything aside, aside for probably several decades. And then I just started to feel like I needed to get connected and I learned to meditate, but I didn't take anything very seriously, but I did learn how to go quietly inside and calm myself. And then one day I just felt like I have to learn a lot more about this. So I started doing some reading and taking a few miscellaneous classes. And one day I just said, I think I'm supposed to really teach this stuff. And it just seems to come out of nowhere. I tell people, a lot of people wander into the into the spiritual waters. And I felt like I just jumped off the bridge. And I don't know why. I just woke up one day and said, this is who I am and I have to learn more about it. So I just set my own course on how to make that happen for me. Did you have any mystical experiences, out-of-body experiences, lucid dreams, or Kundalini awakening? Any of those? No, there was. It was nothing quite that dramatic. Um, I would come out of my meditations feeling like I was being guided to do something. So I knew on some level when I got into that quiet space, I was making a connection to my soul, to source, and I was being guided then what to do um, in life. And I. That's what led me to think I need to do something more concrete. Now, once I really stepped into this field, my clairs, we talk about clairvoyance, clairaudience, our different psychic abilities, those things started to really open up for me, which has allowed me to be a much better teacher and facilitator because I can connect with people on a multi multiple levels. So since I really jumped into the spiritual waters and allowed myself to wake up. I've had a variety of mystical experiences, but it was that wasn't the impetus. That wasn't what actually got me started. It came after I got started. In a way, you just opened the channels to see more of what is here already, <laughs> clearly. But yeah, you mentioned love before, and I just opened, uh, I think it was a card. It was inside of a book that somebody sent to me, and it's a shame I don't know who sent it to me, that book. I'm sure it was a spiritual book, too. Oh, yeah, Teresa Joseph, right? I have to mention her. She's a beautiful spiritual author. And uh, the card said, it's so simple. It's all about love. So I just have this card here with me because uh, I have been wondering and trying to kind of understand what love is for so long. And now it's, uh, it has evolved into something that I never thought it would evolve to be. So before I actually say what is uh, my idea of, of what love is, what is love to you? How would you describe what that is? That's difficult because love is an experience. Um, one of the reasons I think it's hard for people to grasp the idea that all there is is love and all we have to do is be love, which is the simple truth of it all, is that for human beings, love comes with a lot of conditions. You know, you love this person, but not this person. Yeah, I love you if you do this. I can't forgive you unless you do that. So we have all these conditional um, energies connected to love and our compassion, our connection to other people. And as we allow our frequency to go higher and experience more of our true spiritual nature, those conditions start to melt away. And when they do, the inner experience, you just love is so expansive and you love people for absolutely no reason whatsoever, just because they are, no matter what they've done. And it's, I think it's a true heart connection. When you allow yourself to tap into that high frequency of spiritual love, it's like your heart just can't expand any bigger than it is. I think if you try to take your most joyful human experience of love and melt, you know, multiply it by a million times, that's what we're working toward. And I think it's almost impossible to put words to it because it's an, a sensation that is almost indescribable. Mm, yeah, uh, that kind of uh, makes me think about this, the idea of oneness or um, ascension or that divine nature, we can describe it. So maybe that's why you, you speak this way, because love cannot be described in a human manner because it's not human anyway. It's spiritual, it's divine. But for me, it has been, I mean, coming from the human experience, it has been the non-attachment, the less identified I am with the physicalities and all the activities of human activities, 
the more the heart tends to open. That's what it has been, it takes for me to really feel what we call love or oneness. It's just being not detached, but it's almost part of everything. I am everything. I'm not apart from what's happening now and everything around me. You, I like having this conversation. Everything is uh, its part of me, which me is not really what I think. It's, uh, it's that fundamental truth, what you call source. Your book actually mentioned that word too. So I don't know if that makes sense to you, but that's how, yeah, that's how it has been for me lately, the last three months, I would say. No, that makes perfect sense because as we allow ourselves to surrender to that level of love, then we do feel ourselves as one. We're part of each other totally. I mean, as we have to be part of source and part of all creation. Even in science, um, they the more they learn about the DNA, I mean, they know that we're all connected through our DNA strands. They can't explain it all, but the new scientific technology that's out there is showing just on a physical level how connected we are. And when you take that up to a spiritual level, we really can't be separate from each other. That's what oneness is. We're each like a we're like a unique cell in the body of all creation. So we each have our unique qualities, but we're still part of that one wholeness. And you mentioned detachment, which is important. People think of detachment as being um, uncaring. That's sort of the human version of it. But it's really not being attached. It's like non-attachment. You know, it doesn't matter what's happening in that outer world. It doesn't matter who you've been. What matters is the essence of who you are. And that's who I connect with. And nothing else really matters. If you get down to observing each person's light and feeling each person's light, then you feel that connection. And and like you said, the, I said, the love is, love is undescribable. And that sense of oneness just continues to grow as we surrender to that experience. A question that has come to me recently, just I think I asked one of my guests, and then it's here again for you, is why do we do we need to go through this? Why do we have to feel separated from wholeness, from the divine? Because it's, I know it's just a feeling, but why do we have that feeling? Well, the way I describe it is the way I was taught by several masters in books I read. Um, in the book, I, in my book, I talk about the experiment duality or what some of the ascended masters called the great experiment. And the purpose of coming into this human experience was to know what it was like not to be oneness. Uh, the analogy that um, usually comes to me is like, it's very easy, like, for example, if you want to live in the ashram or the monastery where everybody's trying very hard to be loving and compassionate and work together, and you feel like you're a complete, complete peace and oneness, and then you leave the monastery and you go out into the regular third, degree, third uh, dimensional world where people really aren't quite so nice and so loving, and you know, what's that, you know, how do you handle that? So as beings of great light and love, in order to expand our awareness, our learning of who we are as loving beings, we created this experiment to come to Earth, feel this separation from our light and source, to understand more about that type of experience, and then to figure out how we could learn to love again. So we made this separation Everybody did, and now we're moving back into the oneness. So as you're descending and moving into that sort of dark space of feeling separate from source and everyone else, it's very scary, very fear fearful. But when we realize we don't have to exist in that place, that we can come back to the light and live in love, that's when we start our ascension process and we talk about the things that you and I are talking about now. We start to let that darkness shed away and let our inner light come back out. But it's all about expanding who we are as creative beings. And this, this experiment and separation that has been described by many, many masters over the centuries was never meant to hurt anybody. It was meant to just be an experience. But we didn't know what we were going to do. We didn't know what we were going to experience. And I think it became a lot darker and more separating than we expected as beings of light. And so now we're having to learn how to just regroup and realize that this darkness was never real. And we don't have to live here anymore. We just have to simply make the choice to start stepping back into our light and letting this illusion of the world that we're in just fade away and remember who we truly are. As I listen to you, it's almost like activates some memory. I know it's not a physical memory. It's, um, yeah, it's a remembrance of that, of coming into this experiment, as you call it. It just resonates true to me. I don't know why. 
but I have heard it before, of course, and I had the same feeling, like, oh, this is true. And I remember, I don't know who remembers, but something in me remembers us. <laughs> so when you say we created this experiment of feeling separated from oneness, from this wholeness that we are, in your book, Awaken to Ascension, Mastering Oneness and Knowing Yourself as Source, which is, I mean, the title is so self explainable. It says everything. It's so clear to me. I'm not sure if that was in the book or was in your bio. I think it was the book. You said, nothing has been more important to me than what I have learned from my own soul. So when you speak of we creating this experiment, are you speaking of the soul? And if you are, what is the soul? Very good question. And people define soul in different ways. Uh, When I say we, I would like I said, we are each unique aspects, unique selves in this body of creation, the body of source. And when we exist consciously in those higher dimensions of who we are, uh, at our soul level, just a higher frequency of who we are, um, we came together. We cre- and we created this idea of the experiment. When we came down, of course, we began to feel separate, but we've always been connected to that oneness through our own line of frequencies, our multidimensional frequencies. And our soul, for me, the way I design, uh, define it, is a very high frequency of ourselves. Some people say higher self, some people say my inner spirit, and I just use the word soul to mean that God self, that piece of source that is within me, that connects me directly, con- connects me directly to all that is. And that's where my power comes from, because down here in my little human body, looking around the world with my, you know, uh, senses that I have here, I have very limited information. But when I allow myself to go into meditation and connect to that higher self, that higher source of myself that I call soul, that soul knows everything that's going on around me. It knows all about me, my history, my past, my present, my future, my parallels. It knows everything about what's happening on this planet and how it might affect me and what I need to do. So when I get quiet and go to my source of within, my soul within me, then I can access all the information that I need to know what steps I need to take. What do I need to heal for myself? What do I need to be aware of? What actions do I need to take? Because, you know, the God self knows a lot more than we know. So the soul, it's um, always here. It's, um, it's at a dimension of us that we can always access. So it's never hidden. It's always here with us. Always. Yeah. We cannot exist without our soul. I mean, we are part of our soul. There's no way to separate ourselves. We just have to open up to the realization that we have something bigger than just who we are. There's a section in the book where you say the goal is to transcend the roller coaster of human emotions and exist in a state of eternal bliss. So you get very specific here with the human emotions. What I wonder is, so the more we are in touch with our soul, with the source, from your experience and where we are, you are today, is that actually a space where we don't feel emotions or the unwanted ones, the negative ones, or we just allowed all emotions to be and don't really attach to them? This is a great question because it's something I really wrestled with myself when I first started seriously on my spiritual path. And um, I do a little chart in the last chapter of my book that demonstrates what you're talking about. And this came from a Buddhist um, that was sharing a class with me. And the idea that we are on this human roller coaster, we're up, we're down, we're up, we're down, our emotions are all over the place. But when we exist in that state of bliss, everything is like a little straight line. We're just blissful. We're above all of that discord. And I had a very hard time coming to terms with that for several years. But as human beings, our emotions exist at a lower frequency. Just as I said, you asked about love. So we feel love as a human being, but when we open ourselves up to our spiritual nature, that frequency and feeling of love is so much higher than what we would call a human emotion. It's the same saying for compassion or um, understanding, forgiveness. There is a level of the human experience that is an emotion on each one of those um, different frequencies, 
But when we rise above that and start to see and feel ourselves as spirit, truly spiritual beings, when we can observe ourselves and feel ourselves the way our God self, our soul feels us, then we just have this beautiful detachment and unconditional love that transcends this human roller coaster of feelings. So there will come a time when you don't feel anything the same way you do as a human being. It doesn't mean you're not loving, you're not compassionate, you're not understanding and forgiving, but all of those are at such a higher frequency that until you start to experience it, 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 just like love, it's a little difficult to describe. So what we consider positive emotions as human beings have an even higher frequency that we can allow ourselves to access. And that's where the bliss and the peace comes from, of not having to be on that human roller coaster of emotions. And there's nothing wrong with human emotions. It's what we all are going through. So we want to heal the more discordant ones. We want to experience just the love, the peace, and the joy. And when we can do that at the human level and let go, then we can transcend it to live in that state of constant bliss. That sounds really wonderful to live there. I tend not to see destinations for anything, but um, <laughs> I wonder if that's the destination that we are trying to get to that place of eternal bliss and stay there and never, never leave. I guess I say this because I have done a lot of the work of healing and spiritual growth of so really, uh, I had had lots of mystical experiences, but For some reason, which I believe because I have some um, attachments, identifications, of course, and so many of us do, except for those that you call the ascended masters, they have arrived at that place, if there is one. But the question is, is that something that we practice ourselves into being that? Because it's almost practicing to be, and but we already are, so... What are we are trying to do is just to unblock the obstacles to that bliss or we are actually by practicing meditation and those, doing all this spiritual work, we are practicing our, ourselves into become what we already are. Well, it's actually yes to both, us, both of those is um, we have to understand where it is we're going so we understand what we have to let go of. So the healing process, and there are so many ways to go about energetic healing, and there's um, whether you're just using energy work and Reiki, um, things like that, or whether you're actively trying to do clearing processes and healing past lives and dense energies, there's many, many ways to approach our healing process. And just going through your daily life and coming up with a little ahas about, oh, this is good and this is not so good for me. And we make little changes. Every single change we make raises our frequency. So the things that we do in the outer world are important, but at the same time, the only way to really go to where we want to go in this state of being to reach this state of bliss is by practicing through meditation. It's doing energy practices, your meditation, doing anything that raises your frequency because it is a state of being. People are always looking for, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? Well, what you need, the first thing you need to do is sit down and meditate and clear yourself, raise your frequency. You know, whatever, no matter what technique you want to use, sit down, get silent and raise your frequency because that's the only way we get to that state of being where we are in this constant state of love and bliss is by disconnecting more and more from who we see we are as human beings. And that's not something you can really do in the outer world. You can practice being a more loving person in the outer world. You can practice going to my guidance and doing the things that I'm guided to do that are my highest good in the outer world. So those are important, but nothing will get us there except the inner practices that let us let go of the density and allow ourselves to feel ourselves as the light and love that we are. That also resonates so true to me. So it's not really that we are practicing ourselves to be, we are actually doing the quite the opposite. We are unlearning. It's uh, actually going back to a place that's no practice is no need anymore because it was never needed in the first place. We already, what we are looking for, as so many people have said, Well, one of the things about the great spiritual truths, as they've been said over and over again for thousands of years, you know, there's nothing new. There's just new ways to say it. So wherever you heard it, I'm sure it's been the same sentiment's been said by many, many people over the years. So I love them all. So I try to give credit wherever I can. And sometimes it's just whoever said this, I love you. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, right. Sending love to whoever had that insight, right? This profound insight. 
there's something that came to me recently, I think months ago, that I had never heard about. And you just mentioned again in a beautiful way. You said, while the lower self, ego, must be healed to move back into oneness, it is not and never has been bad. We heal the lower self, the ego self, with love. Think of the ego as a lost and terrified child. So that was new to me because, yeah, I think I was trying to kind of suppress the ego or whatever the idea I had about what that is. And now I see it differently. It's actually nurturing that as I would do to a baby. It's almost protecting it. Uh, thank you for bringing that up because I think most of us have been taught over the years uh, that our ego is bad and you want to suppress it. Uh, I actually had a student come to class one day and she had taken a class just the month before and she was trying to learn how to separate her ego and she was told that when um, something didn't go right, she was supposed to send her ego into the corner like, you know, taking a time out. And I'm going, you know, well, you can't do that. We Our, our ego is a part of us. You know, if, if we can't heal ourselves through love, we certainly can't heal anyone else through love. And, um, and that is, we're just, that's the part of us that got lost during this experiment was this ego that fell into this sense of separation and loss of love and it's terrified and alone and how do you heal a child you know you just need to pick this child up sometime and just hug it and love it and kiss it and tell it you know that wasn't the best behavior but it's okay I love you anyway let's just figure out how to fix it instead of trying to separate ourselves more and push away the part of us that needs to love the most so uh, thank you for bringing that up yeah thank you for saying that in that the first time I heard it that way was a few months ago, and there was really, there was a shift in me almost instantly. So it's wonderful to hear from you again in a very clear way. Um, let's see, Marsha. This might be, I have too, way too many notes here from your book, but this might be a good time to talk about. <laughs> I ask this open question to all of my guests who have written books. So I'll ask you too. What was the main intention of writing your book, Awaken to Ascension? I just wanted to share my experiences and the things that had helped me um, get to where I was. The more I taught, I, once I started teaching, I realized that this was, you know, <laughs> after 50 years of my life, this is really what I came to do was to step out and try to share who I am and, and teach others to, to find their way. And the more I taught, the more people I talked to, and I realized the same questions kept coming up for my students. I mean, over many years of teaching, you know, every class, students would have the same sort of questions. And I, even though I had read a lot of books, I had not found any that um, answered the questions the way I would normally answer them in class. So I just felt like that for me, that was, again, an extension of my teaching. I wanted to put something out there for people who might not come to my classes, but had the same questions as all of my students, just hoping that they would find some of their answers to help lead them on to where they wanted to go next. And that's the beautiful thing about intention. It's very important to have them and coming from that place, of course. And it sounds very practical to me, but I know that it's the deeper intention behind it all. It's not really that practical. <laughs> the way you say things, <laughs> I was just smiling, laughing. Like when you say nothing in the physical world is real. So do not give it power. That is a powerful sentence. And of course, you give powerful messages throughout the book. But this is what I, in a way, I'm kind of almost, the soul, something in me, it's um, craving to hear. It's almost like I would, just a lullaby to me. <laughs> I could just live <laughs> the rest of this experiment, just listening to this type of things. There's something, um, I don't know what it is, a transmission, it might be, it, it has to be. It's an energetic, the body feels, the mind, there's a shift within the mind and the, and I, the eye sees the external world differently. It's not the same anymore. So thank you for that. Yeah, I could feel the transmission in the words. Thank you. This might be an, another good time to talk about one of the topics that we uh, mentioned before record and through the emails, uh, the exchange we had. I know we tried to have this conversation a long time ago and, uh, you know, <laughs> that's not going into that, right? <laughs> the technicalities, <laughs> but now we're here. And this, I know a topic you wanted to talk about today as well was about chapter six in your book, Achieving Oneness, 
where you say achieving oneness through healing our male and female energies. I would love for you to unpack that a bit more for us. This is a really big subject, yeah. and it's so important because I think it's often misunderstood. When we talk about spiritual and metaphysical energy, we look at who we are spiritually. Our male and female energies have nothing to do with the gender and our physical bodies. It has to do with the flow of energy in and out and how we create. So the male energy within all of us is the energy that flows out of us, like the out-breath, when we push our energy or out into the world. And that's what we create with. That is our creative energy in terms of bringing things into form. The female energy then is when we pull that energy back in to nurture ourselves and to contemplate and to evaluate. And that's our inward flow of energy. And both the male and female energies must be present for a fully whole and complete creation. An easy way to think about it is electricity. Um, if you know anything about electricity, and I do not know a lot, but you know, there's the positive and negative flow. Every battery has a positive and negative end. So the energy has to flow both ways. So the positive energy flows one way. That's the male energy flowing out into the world to create things. The negative energy then is what flows back the other direction. And without a flow of current going both ways, we don't have a connection. And then... And then to keep ourselves from getting shocked, of course, we want that grounding wire. We want to be grounded into who we are. So when we are getting an idea, we're having an intuitive thought, that's coming from our feminine side. It's where the idea, the image, the intention is created. Um, it's like the womb. So you take the female womb, you have an egg there. This is the seed of the idea. And it doesn't come into form until the male energy comes in and completes that connection, completes that circuit, and then that embryo starts to grow. It's the same thing with an idea and creation. We have to have that quiet, still place, that feminine side where we're nurturing that egg, that idea. And at some point, though, we have to use that male energy and push it out into the world. So we can't live without our in-breath and our out-breath. You can't just breathe out forever with male energy. You won't survive. You cannot just breathe in for energy forever with female energy because you have, haven't got any place to put all of that. So you have to have this constant flow back and forth, right, left, male, female, in and out. And without both of those in perfect balance, our creations are not balanced. So if we let our action energy, our male energy, if we push the energy out of the world to get a lot of things done, and we're not thinking, nurturing, contemplating what we're doing, then we just have a lot of activity. And that's where we get into a lot of trouble because they create chaos. There's no real thought process about how does it affect me? How does it affect everyone? Is this in the highest good? Those kind of thoughts come from our feminine energy, which is the nurturing side. So if we don't take time to think things through, to contemplate, meditate on our ideas and nurture them and think about, am I taking care of the highest good with my actions, then we, we just have chaos. But if we spend all of our time in our feminine energy, just meditating and thinking about things and we take no action, well, then we just stagnate and nothing happens at all. So what, so what happens is most people are out of balance. We're either too active out there using our male energy and doing, doing, doing. And this applies to men and women both without taking time to pull our energy in and nurture ourselves and think about what we're really doing and what's the impact of what we're doing. And other people just like to sit around and think about things but never get anything done. Well, that doesn't help either. So it's this perfect balance of bringing the energy in and I say do it in meditation, you know, pull it in, be in the quiet space. If you have messages that you need to get from your soul about what to do, you know, or just get your frequency up, feel very nurtured, and then put that energy out of the world with the male energy to bring things into form. But um, we need that perfect balance back and forth to find the center way. And um, and it really, it comes down to Eastern philosophy. I still think it's true. The middle way is the only way. If we're too far off to the right and the male energy and too busy and we're too one-sided, that doesn't work. If we're too inward and doing nothing but you know, thinking about things in the feminine energy, that doesn't work. So we have to be somewhere in that center point and allow our energy to flow out and in and out and in. And it's um, something we have to practice because most it's not something we're taught about how to do is to balance our action with our nurturing. And um, we 
just need to each take time and learn what that really means, how to do it, and then go to our guidance as to how we find balance for ourselves. Mm. This also resonates true to me, of course. What comes to me is um, some actions I have seen because I kind of pay attention to people around me, my family members especially, <laughs> all of them. And I see some of them that they engage a lot in, in thinking, but that has to do with memory, like memories of the past. They are reminiscing the past probably with those negative memories, the painful ones per se. And then the action that they take, I see, they're all mindless in in a sense, watching a lot of TV, you know, a lot of those programs that I cannot even listen to them. (laughs) Uh, For some reason, I I can't. In a sense, I'm not attracted to it. So how would you explain that? Because they are using, I mean, they're still part of these dynamics of energy, right? Uh, Masculine and feminine. But when they are engaging in this um, mindless thoughts and then taking mindless actions. What do you call that? I'm just wondering if this is still part of the male and female energy operating or it's something else. Um, actually, it can be. I would say uh, if you want to try to, to label it, to understand it, it's, it's knee-jerk action. It's like we're on autopilot. You know, this is the way it's always been and you can't get off that autopilot. So when something happens, you have this, yeah, this knee-jerk a reaction, and that's how you respond. And um, that can have a lot to do with the male and female energy in that if you don't stir things up so that you change your thoughts and change your actions, nothing happens. So either, uh, I think the, I think that major change has to come inward first because we don't, our outward actions, what we use our male energy for, when we put our energy out into the world to create something, is coming from how we're feeling on the inner, and that's the female energy. So if we're not taking time to go inward and see, do I need to hold on to this or do I need to let go of it? If we don't change the way we're feeling and thinking on the inside, then the energy we put out into the world, the male energy, is not going to change. So I think the key to all change starts with the feminine energy. I think you have to pull yourself inward and contemplate and think about yourself. And, you know, it's not easy for human beings to look at their negativity and see what's wrong within me that I need to change, to use the word wrong, which is very negative, but still that's how we would evaluate it. If it's bringing me pain and sorrow, why do I keep holding on to it? And people are generally a little afraid of that because we find comfort in our pain and sorrow because it's what we're used to. It also just allows us to sit in a spot without moving forward and taking that action in the outer world to change our lives. So nobody's ever said it's easy to be human. Uh, We have to be ready. And until we're ready to look at ourselves and make some changes on the inner, our outer world's not going to change. If it doesn't start on the inside, it won't change on the outside. But it takes a lot of courage. And sometimes people just get there on their own. And sometimes something will happen. There'll be an event of some kind that makes somebody open their eyes and they say, oh my goodness, I've got to make a change. But until that happens, all we can do is send love to people and pray for them when whatever way feels appropriate for you to send your loving energy, hoping that they will be able to create a change for themselves because we can't make others change. All we can do is hold that place of understanding and compassion and hope that they will, as they say, see the light and find a way to come out of out of their pain and sorrow. We don't have to live there, but it's easy to get stuck there. Beautifully answered. Now, it's just very clear to me. They are in uh, repeating patterns and they're just like in this circle of going nowhere, really. No, they are not evolving or seeing anything with clarity. That's very sad to see, though. I witnessed for a while this kind of... Uh, energies. And it's, wow, it's very painful for me. I know the the mind, the body. It was just really painful in a sense, not suffering. It was painful. I was not suffering, but I was in pain too, because we are connected. We can disconnect from one another. So when in the witnessing this kind of other humans having this experience is just very painful. I don't try to detach from it in a sense, kind of how I, I was trying to say before about detaching a sense of identification. I'm not identified, but I'm very much aware of how painful that is. And that's why, maybe because I have been there as a human, of course, and I can empathize with that. It's really sad, Marsha, to still see it, actually, in my family members. But like you said, we cannot change other people or rush the process of awakening, of evolution. I hope we could. (laughs) 
I think we are getting there. <laughs> I'm meeting so many amazing people. <laughs> I think the last thing the last thing you just said was important is that we can't rush. We can't change other people's process. We also can't rush it. So one of the things we really have to do is um, stay in that compassionate place of loving and trying to understand, but at the same time, just allowing that person's process to be what it is. I think that's what you're talking about. We can't rush it for someone else. We can't change it. We just have to be in this level of acceptance that that's where they are right now and be as supportive as we can for where they are. Yes, right. We cannot rush the process. That's for sure. Do you still feel that way? Like this, um, it is compassion. Uh, we're just using words here, but it's... um. There's a level of pain when I witness these things. And I know I try to see a Reiki people in the practitioners to see how can I create some boundaries, energetic boundaries, so I'm not kind of absorbing and feeling everything that's happening around me. Does it happen to you? Or did this happen before? It did. It's um, I've been actively practicing this for, you know, many, many, many years now. I don't feel, I feel compassion now without taking on the pain and suffering of others. Uh, I think you're very empathic. So those people who naturally feel other people's emotions do have a uh, more challenging time and figuring out how to disconnect, but we can all do it. And part of that is allowing ourselves to fully and completely understand that, again, this is an illusion. It is the learning ground. And what people don't get in this lifetime, they're going to be able to learn in the next lifetime. And while I can love and care for someone, I'm not responsible for them ultimately. And I think that's a very difficult thing. It's a challenging thing for us to um, truly integrate is that no matter how much I love someone, I'm not responsible for their spiritual evolution. I can be there to love and support them. I can share and try to educate them when they want to listen and often they don't want to, but when they do, I can try to plant seeds. But I have to disconnect myself from the responsibility for being sure they get it and to love them no matter what pain they're going through and try not to take it into myself. And I know that's challenging. And it was a big step for me to be able to get past that sense of responsibility and wanting to fix things and just allowing people to be where they are and to nurture them as best as I can and let go. So it's something that as your frequency goes higher, you'll get better at. We all will. But it is something that takes some practice and some conscious awareness because when we love people especially, it's it's difficult to uh, disconnect. Right. The more emotionally connected we are to them. Right. Oh, yes. That, it has been an interesting experiment. I love the way you say that too. <laughs> ah, <laughs> to have these people close to us and be emotionally connected to them and then not feel everything that comes with that package. <laughs> What an interesting experience um, this is. So we're almost at the end, Marsha, for today. But I want to mention something else. I have so many notes here. There's another one, that, a beautiful one that you write in a book. You say, you are divine prime. In your universe, only source in you exist. Everything around you is part of the illusion you are creating and co-creating for your evolution. That also, when I read this, it kind of stopped everything. <laughs> the mind stopped and there was the, the instant shift or transmission, some people say. Actually, this came to me in one of my meditations where I said some of my most important learnings are things that I learned from my own soul, my own self as source. And because um, I'm not a mathematician person, I'm not big into math, but all of a sudden this image of prime numbers came up. You know, a prime number is one that can only be divided by itself in one. So for example, the number three can be divided by three and you get one, you divide it by one, you get three. I mean, you can't separate them. They are absolutely one and the same. So when we start to think about ourselves as being that unique cell in the body of all of creation, um, if I am source and source is me, I can never be divided or separated from source in any way. I can't ever be divided or separated from you or anyone else who's part of this, this creation. Uh, we are prime numbers. Uh, we are unique and we are only divisible by the great one, and which only gives us back ourselves. So it goes this this beautiful circle. You cannot ever be separated from source or from anyone in creation. You just have the perception that you're separated, but it's impossible mm. to be separate. Yeah. It's really in interesting because 
We cannot get it with the mind, though. <laughs> I would try when I look at people around me, my family members. I cannot believe I created this. <laughs> I want to <laughs> see those. Uh, some of not everybody. Gosh, they're, they're going to be listening to this interview. It's not going to be fun for them. But some of the my family members, they have been so difficult, challenging. It's hard to believe intellectually that the soul, my soul, had um, chose to to have that kind of challenge. I was going to say, look, yes, look at it this way, is that uh, they're the gift to you to help you see the things that you need to heal within yourself. So all of the challenges, it's like one of the pieces for you is to be able to transcend that empathy, to be able to love without feeling the pain of those around you. So they're providing you with the perfect opportunity to practice and learn the things that you need to heal most for yourself. That's one of the most powerful things about families is that if we, we can get, like you say, out of that mental body and feel the energy, it's what are the gifts they are giving me? What am I able to learn? How am I able to transcend? That's how I ended up with this family is because they're helping me see things that I didn't recognize that I need to heal within myself. And now that I know that, I can go to work on it. When I meditate myself on these things, I see that very clearly and I do have lucid dreams that kind of show me a lot of this, these truths. And then when I hear you speak, and it's like, yeah, of course. But then it's, uh, there's this, um, when you're in the middle of it, it's like you forget everything and you forget that this is just that play. Isn't that interesting that we forget? So the, it seems like the practice is really remembrance, just um, like you said, self-awareness and always remember that you're not separated from anything that's happening. And we just have to keep practicing and trying and learning because we do. We just, as they say, lessons are repeated until learn. And so we get to do this over and over again, which is why it is when you're in that meditative spot, everything seems so natural and perfect. And then all of a sudden you come out and you go, oh, boy, I really deal with this. (laughs) Yes, right. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. Ah, (laughs) Wow. So, yeah, if we don't learn the lesson, is that something that I do a lot of studies with Advaita Vedanta? So they say that over and over again, too, that, yes, um, that will be another lifetime if we don't liberate ourselves in this one, if we don't recognize the truth. So, yeah, I guess I don't have a question about that because I already know that it's very well established being the truth. It's just this interesting dance of forgetting and remembering. And I... I love, you know, people like yourself that have committed and trusted the process of and engaged in these practices of remembering so you don't forget. So I want to thank you again, Marsha, for being one of these uh, human beings who have committed to truth. Thank you. Well, thank you. And thank you for what you do. I think your podcast is beautiful and it's very important. So we thank you as well. (laughs) Uh, The body appreciates. That is the only one that complains. (laughs) Nothing else. (laughs) So your book is amazing. And I had had so many, so many passages here. Maybe we'll have this conversation uh, another day, another time. Who knows? In person. I would love to meet you in person, too. I'm planning to meet my guests somehow. And it's not actually a plan, it's just a a vision. So who knows, you never know when that could happen. I have a few more questions for you, the ending questions, but before that, would you like to add anything else you left unsaid or read a passage in your book, Marcia? I could read a really short passage here. It's just two very short paragraphs. Um, And it's actually the first two paragraphs of the introduction to the book. Remembering who we are as source is an exciting journey. It can also be confusing and a little scary at times. As we recognize ourselves as spiritual beings, we change our lives. Some of these changes are easy, but others are not. Understanding how we got here and why helps us release judgment and fear. Understanding where we're going and how to get there makes the changes easier to integrate. Our spiritual evolution is very personal. We read books, we take classes, we go to religious services to learn more about our spiritual nature and truth. However, the choice to move forward is ours and only ours. As we say, it's always an inside job. Mm -hmm. What is one message you wish everyone to take with them from this conversation we had today? If there is one, of course, there are many, but if there is one, what would that be? It is to try to be 
love as we started this conversation. Try to be love as much as you can be at all times with all people. And that means looking past what you see and feel as judgments. You have We have to get past what we see as right and wrong and look at all of our experiences as steps in learning. And the more we learn, the more we can love. So if we can focus on that loving perspective with everyone and everything, every day as much as possible, we can move past so many of our problems, so much of the discord, and figure out how to live together in peace and harmony and create something beautiful. So again, we said that love is not easy to explain, but looking past what is not loving will help us find the love. That's powerful, empowering, and true. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marsha. Uh, I love everything you do and say. <laughs> the expressions of that love, it can be felt. It's just incredibly beautiful. Thank you so much again for being you. Thank you so much for having me here. And before we say goodbye for today, where can we find more information about you, your books, services, products, and future projects? Well, my website is very simple, marshahankins.com, and my books are all available on Amazon. Uh, my major book right now is Awaken to Ascension, but also if you just type in my name on Amazon, Marsha Hankins, you'll get the whole list of my books that are available. So that's a good starting place. Mm, wonderful. I'll have your website and the link to Amazon on your podcast profile as well. Thank you so much again, and we'll talk soon. Bye for now, Marsha. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Marsha Hankins and her work, please visit MarshaHankins.com. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.